Hello, 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 ladies and gentlemen. I hope you are fine wherever you are, and I wish you great success in your upcoming ACA Audit and Assurance examinations this June 2022. All right. In this video, I'm going to take you through substantive procedures. What are substantive procedures? What are they? What kind of animal are they? Because in every sitting, in every ACA sitting, the AA paper always has something to do with substantive procedures. Be they uh, required as part of uh, a response or be they required as part of a final audit uh, procedure, they are always going to be asked. So in this particular video, in this particular lecture, we are going to discuss more about these uh, procedures. Now, substantive procedures in an uh, ACA audit and assurance paper, they are considered a major area of the syllabus. Okay, uh, according to the marking scheme, every procedure is worth one mark. Okay, and uh, substantive procedures are usually uh, found within a requirement as follows. Describe substantive procedures the auditor should perform to verify, for example, depreciation, tax liability, provision, uh, inventory, etc. They are always going to come in the exam. So what are these? What are they? What are substantive procedures? Auditors need to exp uh, I mean, to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence to support the financial statement assertions. Substantive procedures can be used to obtain that evidence. So substantive procedures are tests to obtain audit evidence to detect material misstatements in the financial statements or at assertion level. Thus, they are focused on financial statements. They are generally in two forms or two types. You've got what are called analytical procedures, substantive analytical procedures. This consists of evaluations of financial information through analysis of plausible relationships among both financial and non-financial data. Analytical procedures also encompass investigation of identified fluctuations or relationships that are inconsistent with other relevant information or that differ from expected values by a significant amount. So through analytical procedures, you will be able to determine where there are certain significant variances and which needs explanations from management. There is also what are called tests of detail. They are in three forms, test of details of transactions, test of details of account balances, and disclosures. Test of detail may be appropriate to gain information about account balances, for example, inventory and trade receivables. Test of detail rather than analytical procedures are likely to be more appropriate with regard to matters which have been identified as significant risks. But the auditor must develop procedures that are specifically responsive to that risk, which may include analytical procedures. Significant risks are likely to be the most difficult to obtain uh, sufficient appropriate audit evidence. So you can see that uh, when we are talking of uh, analytical procedures, here we are, let, uh, let me just take your back, let me look for a pen here. Analytical procedures, these ones are largely related to ratio analysis, uh, ratios, trends, and figures, etc. But when we are talking of uh, test of details, these might involve things like tracing figures, tracing figures uh, to source documents. or from 
actual items on the shelves on the shelves to uh, source I mean to accounting records to accounting records or source document all right test of detail could also be linked to uh, tests on the effectiveness of internal controls on the effectiveness of internal controls to see if they are to see if they are those controls are working as they should all right they might also include things like uh, secularization of receivables Secularization of receivables or payables. Those so 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 you can see that test of details are those other procedures which are not analytical. In other procedure, the auditor might do uh, to test an account balance or disclosure or a transaction itself could uh, I mean are referred to as test of details. All right. But when you are uh, analyzing, when you are doing ratio analysis, when you are doing trend analysis and so forth, those ones are called analytical procedures. Alright, let's move on. More on analytical procedures. Analytical procedures can be used at all stages of the audit, starting from the planning stage as risk assessment procedures. So at planning stage, at the planning level, Analytical procedures are part of the risk assessment procedures where we will be using the interim financial reports, the budgets, as well as management accounts. They can also be used as substantive procedures to obtain audit evidence directly. All right. Remember the use of analytical procedures at the substantive testing stage is optional, but others must perform this one is a requirement. They should perform analytical procedures at the planning as well as finalization stages of the audit. ISA 520 analytical procedures provide guidance for auditors on the use of analytical procedures as substantive procedures. So we have got this at uh, auditing standard ISA 520. Okay which talks of analytical procedures according to these standards uh, analytical procedures include the consideration of comparisons with comparable information for periods for prior periods anticipated results on the entity from budget or forecast expectations prepared by the auditors for example for example estimation of depreciation what the auditors think depreciation should be uh, should be compared with what managers have uh, reported as a charge of depreciation. So such comparison, such such comparisons are considered uh, anal analytical procedures. There could also be comparisons between in uh, what the entity's results are and what the industry's results say or are. Then, those between elements of financial information that are expected to conform to a predicted pattern based on the end experience, such as the relationship of gross profit to sales, they are also part of analytical procedure. Then, those between financial information and relevant non-financial information, such as the relationship between payroll cost to number of employees, sometimes we discover that the payroll cost is not in tandem with the uh, the number of employees available all right where we have got a higher wage bill but very few employees which are employed all right ISA 520 states that uh, when using analytical procedures a substantive test the auditor must determine the suitability of particular analytical procedures for given assertions this is where, why we are being tested uh, to provide uh substantive procedures relevant to a particular scenario you need to know if this particular procedure is actually attending to the requirement 
Some of the procedures might be irrelevant and you're not going to be given any mark. Then, you need to evaluate the reliability of data from which the author's expectations of recorded amounts or ratios is developed. Right? Sometimes you might be given uh, an inventory figure, but you need to ask yourself how reliable is this uh, source of evidence from which the inventory figure was obtained. So the reliability of the evidence should be considered. This is where you, you need to point to the examiners that sometimes uh, a written representation of management is better than their verbal assertion. Okay? Or to a secularized uh, payable uh, balance is better than what management simply are reporting. We need to secularize, especially when there are no supplier statements available. Alright, we need to approach the suppliers to get the figures because it is better to obtain from the host mark than to be told by another party. The auditor should develop an expectation of recorded amounts or ratios and evaluate whether this is sufficiently precise. To identify a misstatement that may cause the financial statement to be materially misstated. This is self-explanatory. Alright. The auditors need to develop their own expectations uh, or ratios uh, and evaluate whether this is sufficiently precise to identify a misstatement. Sometimes a ratio uh, might signal that something could be wrong somewhere. So if they do their own expectations, uh, they would be able to evaluate what is going on within the client. All right. For example, when you are talking of uh, things like receivable days, all right, and the client is actually, he has given us a receivable and they are, they are claiming that those receivables are all recoverable. But if we have seen that the receivable days have actually increased by far much a wider uh, margin in terms of days, then uh, we would be uh, inquisitive on the reasonableness of their assumption. Lastly, we have to determine the amount of any difference that is acceptable without further investigation. This has to do with uh, things like materiality. Sometimes uh, some differences could be, you know, within the materiality threshold, then we need to just ignore such type of differences. <coughs> Excuse me. Substantive procedures. Uh, in the exam, you need to have this acronym uh, cast at the back of your head because you will need it. All right, you need to have uh, this I E R A E O U uh, acronym uh, as part of your aid memo. All right, where A stands for analytical procedures because when the examiner asks you to perform substantive procedures, you just have to have this uh, aid memo by your side in your heart because remember, you're not going to be allowed to enter into the exam hall with anything with any written document all right so just have to memorize this so a is for analytical procedures a inquiries and confirmation where we have to inquire of management or we need to confirm from third parties inspection of tangible assets or documents inspection is done on documents themselves or to inspect the assets, the physical assets themselves, to see if they are actually there. All right. If you are talking of cars, then you have to go to the car park to see the, if there are cars there. All right. But that's not enough. You need to corroborate that by inspection of the document, the asset register, as well as the vehicle registration book. You need to see that. All right. The asset register might say that we've got a We've got a car, and then the car might be actually outside in the garage, but that's not enough because you need to see the vehicle registration book to see if the car is actually being owned 
for ownership okay for ownership or rights and obligation all right <clears throat> so uh inspection we talk about it then observation this is usual uh, on processes you need to, to observe how things are being done all right so you have to observe uh for example you want to ascertain if employees are being paid their weekly wages personally by the cashier you need to observe if there is actually proper counting there is another person who is checking the uh the cash count okay the cashier uh, first count and then he gives to another person who cross checks to see if the balances are correct so that's observation <coughs> observation of processes then recalculation all right here we have got two uh, important terms recalculation calculation and reperformance now when we are talking of recalculation we are seeing simply saying that we want to find everything 100% correct okay a given set of figures you do you redo the, the the computation and you just have to find everything should 100% agree then we have got uh, reperformance all right reperformance uh you'll be given just a symbol of uh, the, the data and then you have to reperform it all right you, you you might be expecting you you will be expecting some little variation uh, over it okay but in either case recalculation and reperformance they are often used interchangeably but in reperformance we are simply saying that uh, some some variance is expected <laughs> okay. sometimes reperformance is also used where uh, the procedure doesn't actually involve figures where calculation sounds awkward okay sometimes uh, calculation might sound awkward and you, there is no need to calculate anything there are no figures to be calculated but you just have to reperform to see if you are going to come to the same conclusion okay uh, management claims these are sessions all right we've got a financial statement of financial position uh, claims as well as statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income claims all right now for this for the statement of financial position we are going to have these ones all right these are the claims which manage, managers would be making there is what is called existence all right are uh, assets which are being claimed to be owned by the entity actually there all right so you need to see if they are in existence if they exist all right then valuation okay existence then valuation you need to see if the amounts which have been reported by managers are actually the correct amount so valuation we are talking about the amount at which the items the assets the liabilities are being uh, recognized the amount at which those assets are being recognized then completeness we need to see if uh, everything about an accounting balance has been recorded okay everything that was supposed to be recorded about an item has actually been recorded nothing has been left behind then rights and obligation we need to 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 be assured that uh, the entity has got rights over the assets okay 
has got a, a claim right over the assets and is obliged to to settle the the purported or the reported liabilities all right so to on assets there should be a claim right then on liabilities <coughs> there should be an obligation to settle so it is the auditor's objective to determine if such claim right is there and if an obligation is actually there for a liability to be uh, recognized then on this uh, statement of profit or loss managers would claim that everything is complete so you can see that completeness is actually in both of the statement in both statements all right in this sfp with with completeness in the statement of profit or loss there's also in our session that managers are claiming that the sales figures you are seeing there are complete nothing has been left behind no sales have not been recorded no expense has not been recorded everything has been recorded and nothing more nothing less then uh occurring the transactions which we claim to have occurred they actually occurred all right then everything was actually recorded the, the expenses and the income for this particular period has actually occurred in that particular period this is a cut off the issue of cut off all right the expenses and the income for this particular period is actually been recorded in that particular period then classification every the incomes and the expenses were accurately classified or were properly classified then accuracy our figures everything there the presentation you are seeing is actually accurate in terms of our the applicable financial reporting framework everything is accurate they are not they are free from errors or fraud now you also need to consider this acronym data three okay when you are required uh, i mean when you are attempting to answer the substantive procedure requirement you need to know where are you going to obtain the evidence the first thing is uh, the D in the data three. There is a D there. The D, the first D is for directors. You need to sometimes inquire of management or to obtain written representations from management about certain things. All right, the directors or managers. Then the assets. You need to know that there are assets which should be evaluated for existence, valuation, and so forth. Or sometimes for inspection. Then the documents. You need to review the documents, you need to inspect documents, and so forth. Accounting books and records. You need also to uh, review uh, the general ledger uh, for... Uh, the recognition of that particular asset all right you also need to review uh records like uh the payable days uh, i mean the the payable uh the purchase day book okay the purchase day book for the uh, primary evidence of an entry a purchase entry or uh as part of your uh evaluation for the payables figure you need to trace to the source document which is the payables day book as well as the uh purchases invoice from the supplier all right so we also need to verify the accounting records sometimes you need also to to uh inspect the the relevant cash book entry if a payment to, to determine if the payment was actually paid or, or made there is then this third party uh, where we'll be talking of uh, uh, 
bank evidence, lawyers for provisions, especially legal claims. You need to uh, review correspondence with the lawyer for bank balances. You need to actually confirm from the bank, inspecting the bank statement, or to get or uh, to approach the bank for uh, a bank balance. All right, and uh, we also need to secularize receivables or payables uh, confirmation. All right, please be careful here on the data. There is what is called positive confirmation as well as negative confirmation. Negative confirmation. All right, positive here when there is a high risk that uh, our internal controls over the data were so weak, we would want a positive uh, confirmation where every customer that has been uh, secularized or approached should actually give us a comment whether they agree or not with the balances which we which we want to ascertain or which we are saying they owe okay so we expect responses from them that's a positive confirmation but when we are talking of a negative confirmation the risk of uh, receivables being overstated is very low uh, the controls on the receivables were so tight so we just want only responses from customers which are in disagreement only those who are disagreeing then should actually respond to us they should respond to us that's a negative uh, confirmation now for suppliers on suppliers uh, we only do confirmation when there are no supplier statements because supplier statements are usually the most effective uh, form of evidence because it has been given freely without any uh, inducement or any pressure from the auditors they they sent uh, on a normal business uh, uh, arrangement to the to, to our client and they are saying that our client is going this much so their evidence is actually better than our uh, induced evidence where we make a follow-up so we will only make a confirmation follow-up when they when there are no supplier statements available i'm sure they we are clear okay, let's move okay another point here is that uh on negative uh confirmation on the receivables we will be having a higher uh symbol of uh, smaller amount where we'll be having smaller amounts involved there are small amounts involved and uh, we just want uh, information from those receivables who are disagreeing with our balances all right i think that's clear now so what's next we have to apply uh those acronyms which we have mentioned that is the r-a-e-o-u data three every uh evcr or coca uh for your uh, reference uh these are the evcr i'm sorry i just uh i did not actually highlight them that's the evcr for the statement of financial position assertion where we say that v, uh, e is for existence v for valuation c for completeness r for rights and obligations and then we've got coca coca is here all right coca is here where we talk of completeness occurrence cutoff classification and accuracy all right then uh, you'd also discover that other assertions like example accuracy uh, would also uh, be linked to other assertions like for example valuation in the statement of financial position where the value should actually be accurate value all right something like that um the data three ladies and gentlemen data three okay that's the data three sorry <laughs> all right and uh, so we have to apply all these acronyms all right the the RAEOU is applied on the data tree on the, our directors, assets, documents, uh, the assets, the documents, the accounting records, and 
uh, accounting books and records as well as on the confirmation of third parties like the lawyers uh, the data the payables to verify the EVCR okay to verify existence existence to verify valuation uh, the completeness completeness and the rights and obligation the rights and obligation all right or the coca we need to verify these uh, we talk of completeness occurrence uh, classification uh, accuracy and another seed there is actually troublesome okay and I'm sure you can guess it that one you can get that one the class uh, uh, the cutoff so you can see that you actually need to have the information at your fingertips otherwise you might be easily thrown overboard okay now uh, there are two main uh, substantive procedure requirement uh, where we'll be having a scenario okay there is sometimes a no scenario situation where the examiner randomly simply say that list the old uh, substantive procedures relevant to the valuation of inventory there you just have to go by the textbook okay you just have to go everything by the textbook but you might also give a scenario especially on question 16 uh well you will be uh, requiring you to first read and read the scenario and then you have you are being asked substantive procedures from the scenario you then you have to in your answer you just have to tailor uh your substantive procedures to the scenario although this, the the textbook knowledge will be you will be helping you but you don't forget to tailor the substantive procedures to the particular situation otherwise you are going to be given a zero this is a very serious professional exam so you need to show some maturity uh, because by the end of the day you are being trained to be a professional in practice okay so you're not going to be just a theoretical academic but you are just go you are going to be somebody on the ground now uh, substantive procedures specific areas we have got receivables for receivables we are going to use this EVCRY because receivables are statement of financial position items <laughs> and we say that sub, uh, in the statement of financial position every item that is for the statement of financial position should should be evaluated for existence existence okay existence valuation uh if you see our completeness completeness and rights and obligation those are the four items which every item in the sfp should be evaluated on okay so existence valuation completeness right and obligation so you, you you then have to ask yourself what are the sources of documents for me to do that evaluation for me to uh, verify the existence which source of, of document do i need you need the age receivables listing this tells you uh how old is this particular date okay how old is this particular data all right or receivable is he within uh, 30 days or is he after 30 days is he after two months and so forth all right because the 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 longer the period before the the date is paid the risk that uh, they had the risk that we are going to recover anything all right so this is something to do with the reasonableness of the general 
a receivable allowance to see if the management's general receivable allowance is actually reasonable. You need to know, uh, you need to obtain the aged receivable listing to see if uh, if they are claiming that only 5% are going to be uh, a general allowance, it's going to be the general allowance for receivable. If, if you see now on the age receivable listing that all the data, the company's policy is to have receivables which pay within 30 days. But if you see now that according to the age receivable listing, their receivables are now having 72 days, some 90 days, some 100, then you have to question that the reasonableness of the 5%, sometimes it should be more because the higher the day, I mean, the more the days, the higher the risk. So the, the allowance should be increased to say 20% of them are not going to pay or even 50% and so forth. So there you would also be testing the valuation of the receivable and also the existence of the receivable. Sometimes, sometimes such receivables are no longer in existence. <laughs> okay, so the source of documents is actually very, very useful and important. Then let's talk of the sales invoices. These uh, actually give evidence of this of, of the valuation of the receivable. All right, the valuation of the receivable. Then the goods dispatch notes. This gives us evidence of uh, the existence of the receivable. All right, the existence uh, because we would also be assured that. Actually, the goods were dispatched to the client, all right? But uh, the issue of uh, completeness, the rights also, the rights, we, we, we dispatched goods. So we have got a claim right over the money. We need our money, all right? So uh, the rights and obligation is also the, the issue of completeness is also touched there uh, because we would see that actually the transaction the sales transaction occurred all right uh, the, it occurred so therefore we have got a claim right over the receivable and also the all the recording that was supposed to I mean the recording is actually well supported by source documents there we have got three receivable secularization letters these also help us to determine the actual values uh, so the, the valuation is touched here uh, also uh, to verify if our value is complete our figures are complete after we secularize we then have to we then get assurance that if they agree then our records are complete Post year and bank statements. These also uh, tell us more about the valuation of our uh, the valuation of our receivables. Because if the bank statement is showing that some customers are paying, therefore we can be assured that the the the, the receivables being claimed were genuine. So the valuation was correct, and also it's evident that they did exist they did exist so you need to inspect the post year end bank statements to find out if you uh if the the receivables were actually genuine by evidence of them paying up all right so you can see that uh i am explaining the procedure you should do on the evidence available so the first thing you have to know is to know the evidence, all right? The post year end bank statement. It's not actually a procedure. Don't be confused. It's just a source of doc of evidence. But you just have to do a procedure on that source of, source of evidence. You have to perform a procedure on the source of evidence. For example, you have to inspect the post year end bank statement <laughs> for evidence that the receivables were paying for you to know if those uh, i mean for you to ascertain the, the the existence of the receivable as well as the valuation of those receivables are we together ladies and gentlemen 
Then we talk of uh, uh, the policy for allowance for doubtful debt. You have to re, uh, inspect the policy documents, all right, or you have to inquire from management uh, their policy for allowance for doubtful debt. That's where they will tell you that uh, we generally uh, say, uh, assume that 5% are not going to pay us. <laughs> now, you, just, you then have to corroborate with the information from the age receivable list to see how, how genuine and how reasonable is their policy. We talked about that. All right, then uh, you have to obtain a schedule or breakdown of receivables to be cast for accuracy. Then you have to obtain uh, the receivable schedule, the breakdown of every uh, receivable to see the is so and so well, is owing so much, this and that. And then you have to cast everything to see you are going to come with to the uh, figure. To the same figure is that of management. All right. Here again, you will be uh, verifying the valuation of the receivable. All right. So, like I said, every item which is from the statement of financial position should be tested for existence, valuation, completeness, right, and obligation. So, you may also, uh, in the exam, you may base your, 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 your answer on the knowledge of those assertions, existence, valuation, completeness, right, and obligation. All right. To test for existence of the receivable, then you have to secularize the receivable to see if the customer is acknowledging his debt. All right. Uh, you may also start from the source of the evidence where we talk of uh, the secularization letters. All right. And then you get back to the assertions. Now, let's go to the pebbles. You can also see that they use the same EVCR acronym there. And the source of evidence for payables, we are talking of the eight payables listings. This gives us the, the, the number of days the payable has been uh, going unpaid. All right. So we need to have that listing. All right. We also, uh, if the payables days is getting large and large and large, it's, it's good for cash flow purposes, but at the same time, might actually affect the business relationship of our client and its suppliers sometimes if they uh, it might be an indication that they are failing to pay or to service their payables therefore you need to then have to worry on their going concern all right on their going concern assumption all right so you have to review the payables listing ob obtain and review the payables listing okay for evidence that uh, they are honoring their obligations <laughs> okay the, uh, or maybe on on the way to ascertain if management is actually uh, servicing its debt or uh, they are trade payables all right you need to have that evidence all right as part of your going concern uh, analysis all right, uh, the purchases invoices, this gives us evidence of the value of the payables, the source documents, the goods receives notes, uh, gives us also evidence that uh, a transaction uh, actually uh, did okay, and we have, we received the goods, therefore, we have got an obligation to settle. All right, we've got an obligation to settle. All right. If we combine evidence of the purchases invoices and the goods received not evidence, we then have to would be assured of the completeness. Okay, the purchases invoice, the goods received not, as well as the purchases ledger. All those, uh, the purchase day book and the purchases ledger, as well as the general ledger record. All those give us information about the completeness of the transaction. Then, uh, the post-year-end bank statements, this gives us 
information that they we are honoring those payables therefore they did they were actually genuine payables so they were in existence the payable was in existence and we are now we are in a, a, a position of servicing them therefore those going concern um, worries could be mitigated at this level then supply statements this also give us evidence of the valuation of the payable supply secularization where supply statements are not there all right uh, the supply secularization letters are also good evidence of uh, the valuation of the payable or its existence done now on non-current assets, uh, the source documents are the non-current asset register. This one is actually very, very important. Every item, every asset which is considered a non-current asset should have an entry in the asset register. The non-current asset register. We need to see the purchase invoices. Okay, for n non-current asset that has been added during the year all right then uh sales invoices or capital disposal forms uh, uh should also be inspected all right and also have to remember uh the provisions of ias 16 uh proper plant equipment which says that uh the cost of the asset should recognize at cost should initially be recognized at cost when it is uh, procured right and the cost involves the purchase uh, costs the actual purchase cost on purchase invoices all right as well as uh, other directly attributable costs to bring the, the the plant or the equipment to its usable state uh, which include the installation costs the legal fees transport costs etc which are directly attributable to the uh, cost of bringing the asset to its point of use so you need also to revisit uh, that area All right uh, so when we sell assets when the assets have been disposed of this is when we have to uh, inspect the sales uh, invoices, all right? Sales invoices uh, or capital disposal forms. They should be inspected. Then, uh, bank statements and cash, okay, for evidence that uh, the asset has been paid for. Right, the asset has been paid for, or the asset has been disposed. So, therefore, we need to have uh, an entry on the bank statement to see that the entity received money, a credit entry on the bank statement, or a debit entry in the cash book should be seen uh, as evidence that actually an asset was disposed of during the year and we obtained something. Then, uh, physical assets themselves, we need to see them to inspect them to see if they are there. Like I told you, then ownership documents, including the deeds and registration documents for cars, so forth, or title deeds for land, uh, for, for land and buildings. Then uh, the depreciation policy and rates. We need to know that the depreciation policy, which has been adopted by the entity, whether they are using straight line or reducing balance method, and the reasons why we need to inspect in the policy. All right. Uh, the capex budget or capital replacement plans uh, what is management's uh, plan for the future uh, how long do they take to replace an asset and so forth this is part of the inquiry okay but uh, on the EVCR what would you which assertion would you be uh, uh, testing them when you in inspect the capex budget or capital replacement plans all right uh 
We say that E is for existence. Existence. And V, valuation. R, rights and obligation. Then completeness. All right. So when you'll be checking the CAPEX budget, uh, here you would also be uh, having some inclination towards the valuation of non current assets. All right. You'd be uh, inclining towards the valuation of assets. Right. And by assessing budget, by assessing uh, forecast, all those would be having something to do with the valuation of the items at hand. All right. So if the current capex values are actually uh, different from budgeted uh, values, then the management would be having a cup of tea with you. They would be having. Uh, invited you for inquiry all right so uh, that's the thing there then uh, non-current assets non-current assets must exist okay be completely recorded all right be completely recorded also when you look at the budget itself it might tell you something about the completeness of the recorded assets. If there is a wider variance, then something could also be not, not okay. Then uh, they should be valued appropriate, uh, appropriately and must be owned or controlled by the end. That's the EVRC or EVCR. The author needs to obtain substantial appropriate evidence over existence, over existing assets, all right, additions, the revaluation to see if they are reasonable, and depreciation. Related disclosures, the PPE note, and so forth, should also be subject to verification and review. Remember, in terms of financial accounting standard number 16, there should be some. Uh, some note to the financial statements which talks about certain disclosures concerning those uh, non current assets. An example of the disclosure is the choice of uh, uh, valuation basis. Remember, in uh, IAS 16, there's got IAS 16, there's got two valuation bases there is a cost model and a revaluation model. So initially, the asset is recognized at cost, okay, but on subsequent periods, the managers have to choose whether they are going to use the cost model or the revaluation model. All right, the, using the cost model, the asset is is valued at its cost less accumulated depreciation. But when you are using the revaluation model, the asset is revalued frequently, okay? F frequently. Uh, let's say at least three every three months or every two months, the asset is revalued, all right? So the asset will be recognized at revalued amounts, less and uh, accumulated depreciation, all right? That's the deal there. So, once you know what the accounting standard requires, then you can also be in a position to evaluate if managers have done it right or not. But by the end of the day, if an item is a statement of financial position item, for example, in a current asset, therefore, you have to use the EVCR acronym. Existence, you have to test for existence. Is the asset actually there? How do you do that? Then you have to go and inspect the asset. Okay, inspect the asset, inspect the documents giving reference to that asset. For example, uh, inspect the, the asset register. 
for an entry of that asset in there and also have to inspect it physically you also have to inspect the relevant particular document okay individual document relevant to that particular asset for example the title deed or the registration book or registration document for that asset then your home and try you then go to another uh, assertion valuation you have to check the purchase invoices from the suppliers okay and uh, that the purchase invoices for every day of valuation all right for every day of the cost of that asset all right and then uh also uh documents like uh professional valuers for revalued amount you need to verify to see if the revalued amount are actually accurate or they are uh are complete so for valuation you need to inspect the certificates of the professional valuers of the property to see if the, the revalued amount were actually uh, <coughs> correct or uh, complete all right uh, I think we've talked much there ladies and gentlemen let's move on there is this uh, statement of profit or loss item and you can see that we'll be using the corker all right and we said uh if you still remember uh corker stands for what <coughs> this is the corker ladies and gentlemen where we talked of the completeness uh occurrence classification cutoff and accuracy okay so we'll be using the same acronym there uh to attack a statement of profit or loss item you might be given an expense in the exam in the exam or an income item okay for example revenue <clears throat> so if you you use your coca uh, let us just uh, replicate it here where we say that uh, the C uh, is for uh, completeness occurrence right and uh, classification cut off accuracy all right so uh you need to know if the inventory uh, recording was complete uh the transaction actually occurred and it is uh, accurately classified or, or, or properly classified and then the cutoff was was also not an issue so um, you go to the general ledger and you have to look at the revenue control account to see if the revenue control account is actually tallying with the uh, revenue in the SOPF the statement of profit and loss they should agree okay so review the general ledger uh, revenue control account to see if the reported revenue figure is actually the same as that in the uh, revenue control account for completeness all right <coughs> you then also have to look at uh to inspect the sales day book all right inspect the sales day book uh for evidence of occurrence that the transaction actually occurred all right because when a transaction a credit transaction initially occurs it is recorded in the sales day book inspect the sales invoices for uh to, to see if uh, the figures which are being reported are at actual values okay or correct values or or for accuracy of those 
uh, figures, all right, uh, in the extraction of data, all right, if there was accuracy in the extraction of data from the source document to the books of accounts. Okay. You also have to uh, inspect the source invoices to see if they actually relate to this particular, uh, to see if the sales figures actually relate to the accounting period, okay, for cutoff reasons, all right, so you need to uh, look at the dates of the invoice, all right, for cutoff reasons. Inspect the customer contract to establish if there is actually a business contract. All right, because in terms of if it's 15, you have to identify the contract with customers as part of the first step model. All right, is there a, is there a contract? Sometimes there could be, uh, if it's 15, there could not be a contract. Okay, there would not be a contract. So in that situation, the management would have to recognize certain sales. Inspect goods received notes for evidence of occurrence of the transaction if there is actually uh, evidence that goods have been received, therefore the transaction has occurred. All right. Also, uh, by inspecting uh, sales invoices, you would see if the the figures being spoken about would be uh, would have been properly classified. <laughs> then, sales orders is another source of evidence, which would also uh, help us to verify if uh, the transaction, the sales, a sales transaction, had occurred. Okay, what about inventory? What are the sources of evidence? We have got the eight inventory listing. Okay, this shows how for how for how long a particular inventory item has been in stock. Okay, slow moving inventories could be easily identified from the inventory listing. That will also assist us in the valuation of inventories. <laughs> In the valuation of inventory. Remember, inventory is valued at the lower of cost and NRV. So, the older the inventory, <coughs> the worry, the more the worry about the valuation of that inventory. All right, uh, the inventory assets themselves, you need to uh, verify uh, or to inspect them to see uh, if they they are there on the shelf. Also, to see if uh, they are within their expiry dates. Inventory count sheets. These also provide us evidence about the quantities of the inventories. Okay, purchase invoices for the valuation of those inventories. Then, uh, goods received notes as also as evidence, as, source, uh, as primary evidence that the goods have been received and they should be accounted for. Sales invoices, these also help us in the uh, valuation of our uh, inventories because if the NRV is lower than the cost, then uh, the goods have to be written down. So the sales invoices would also give us the clear picture. When we sold the goods, at what value did we sell them? Sometimes if we sold them below the cost values, then there is need for a write down of inventory or it might signal that inventory is overvalued. Then goods dispatched no goods dispatched not this is also um, 
evident that we uh, we sold some items of inventory and therefore inventory has to be reduced okay or inventory is being sold therefore the values at which the event is being recognized could be genuine because there is proof that inventory is being dispersed is being is being taken by customers all right then client calculations of overhead allocations and apportionment and percentage of completion of working progress especially if uh you are given a scenario of a manufacturing firm okay labor costs are part of the value of inventory okay they're part of the working progress they're part of the total cost of the uh, of the units produced so you also need to inspect clients calculations okay to inspect or to obtain clients calculations of overhead allocation and apportionment and the percentage of completion of working progress and inquire of whatever assumptions which they have used <laughs> all right now provision warrant claims and legal claims these are just the same all right uh, the procedures for their for in respect of them are just the same so uh, we just have to check all the and mass so the sources of evidence in this case are management and in-house legal advisors for information on the contingencies. Here you will be asking of the probability of us ending up paying and so forth. All right. Or the probability of success or failure of the case, etc. Then uh, minutes of meetings of the board and correspondence between the entity and its external legal advisors you have to review the board minutes to see if uh, there is actually a tug of war between the client and the the bereaved party or or the aggrieved party <laughs> okay the aggrieved party then uh, the legal expense account this is almost like an analytical procedure where you would be evaluating uh, any, any differences between the current legal expense versus the prior period versus uh, I mean legal expense to see if there is been a wide uh, gap or wide difference breakdown of all provisions that recognize breakdown of all provisions recognized and details of all contingencies disclosed you also have to have a breakdown to see who is claiming against who or who is claiming against the client and at how much and how do they arrive at that figure all right for example just have also to inspect any supporting documentation from the legal counsel and so forth detailed analysis of all provisions showing <coughs> excuse me detailed analysis of all provisions showing opening balance balances movement and closing balance you have to inspect or to review uh, an analysis an analysis of all provisions for management given by management showing opening balances provision uh, uh, movement and closing balance then post year end bank statements and cash book this gives evidence whether the entity ended up paying for that uh, provision all right if they pay let's say there was a legal claim and a provision had been made if after the year end the balances were actually paid then it gives evidence that the provision was actually well valued or correctly valued all right but if there is no any evidence of payment for three months then you can also see that the provision was wrongly placed if if uh, uh, in corroboration with evidence from uh, the legal counsel or board minutes there is nothing being spoken about that legal claim then you could also see that uh, the provision was wrongly placed in any case it should have been a contingent liability we should have been shown in the note to the financial statements.
So you need to inspect the post year end bank statements to uh, support the evidence that a warrant, a warrant claim or legal claim exists. Then uh, provision schedule for recalculation. You must be given this schedule and you have to recalculate it for accuracy. All right. Uh, that's for accuracy. Okay. Like I said, uh, the the assertion of valuation goes hand in hand with the assertion of accuracy. When you are talking of the statement of profit or loss. All right. So sometimes, if you just use for accuracy, it's also uh, going to award you max. Then. All right. You are going to be awarded max. Okay, um, the bank and cash, the source document, they are the bank confirmation letter, okay, the bank reconciliation is also another source, and then the cash book, you need to inspect for the cash book to see if the balance that is being reported on the financial statements is actually the same balance which is being reported by the cash book, then the bank statements themselves should also give evidence about the bank and cash balances the loans the, the acronym applicable is the AVCR because loan is a statement of financial position item so you need to inspect the loan agreement to see the terms of the loan and uh, to obtain evidence that the management are actually in a loan or in some long-term obligation with a financier okay of the bank then you need to see evidence that the loan was received by a debit entry in the cash book all right also by uh, inspecting the credit entry the credit side of the cash book to see evidence of loan uh, interest repayments interest repayments loan interest repayments then uh, the loan agreement also would would tell if the loan was actually a, a normal loan okay if it was a normal loan which should be, be recorded as a loan in terms of if it's not financial uh, instruments but sometimes the loan agreement the loan terms might be non-commercial uh, might, might be at non-commercial terms which might suggest evidence of uh, a related part transaction okay so uh, a, rela a related part uh, transaction should be accounted for in terms of IAS uh, 24 alright that is related party disclosures all right where the loan has been given at non-commercial terms let's say by a, a sister company then we can't uh, consider such a loan as a loan all right uh, it won't be a loan and it should be uh, considered as uh, a related party <coughs> transaction and should be supported by disclosures it should be supported by disclosures okay uh, so uh, in the exam when you see a loan then you have to inspect the loan agreement to see if the loan was at commercial terms and uh, if it's nine is being complied with uh, for example the loan should be recognized at fair value okay the loan should be recognized at fair value uh, when the loan has been the loan contract has been entered into okay uh, but now you may discover that uh, the loan 
uh, was not at commercial terms and that's where uh, issues uh, come into play all right if the loan terms were not commercial ones or the loan was being given below uh, market terms then you have to uh, make some adjustments there where uh, you have to split uh, the loan okay you have to split the loan uh, to split if not on uh, commercial terms commercial term you have to split okay split into um, the below market below market elements okay below market element and the loan element and loan element okay that element which is uh, below market as well as the uh, loan element all right has to be considered all right so uh, how do you account for the below market element uh, of the loan uh, this one you then have to consider using other accounting standards all right just have to consider uh, accounting for such aspects which are below market market uh, elements uh, for example uh, IAS IAS 19 employee benefits employee benefits okay employee benefits if uh, uh, the loan was made uh, to employees all right if the loan was made to employees uh, then uh, it should be accounted for under IAS 19 all right or uh, you may simply have to apply the related party disclosures uh, as part of IAS 24 all right uh, related party disclosures but uh, or you simply have to uh, apply the conceptual framework if there is no accounting standard that can address that the conceptual framework to see if the loan fits the element of a liability you may discover that uh, they could there are no obligations uh, over the uh, the loan <laughs> you simply uh, being claimed by managers that this was actually a loan from a parent or from some other bank but without any repayment obligations attached to it so you may discover that it might end up failing to meet the loan so by inspecting the loan agreement you might be ending up uh, seeing what would be going on okay uh, Alright, so after you split the below market elements, so the below market elements, they, they are the ones which are troublesome, but the loan element itself would be treated in accordance with IFRS 9. Okay, just treat it in accordance with IFRS 9. Okay, covering all the aspects of the classification of the loan, the measurement, and whatever impairment that is attached to the loan okay so uh let's suppose a subsidiary or a parent has loaned a fixed um a fixed term loan to a subsidiary okay uh if the loan has been given at no commercial terms then we just have to do what we discussed there we consider the below market element and the loan element all right so the loan element is going to be treated in accordance if it's nine 
or and then the below market element is what we have to consider as uh, simply the related uh, part uh, element okay so the below market element is just the difference between the fair value of the loan okay the fair value of the loan and the actual loan which has been given that difference is what is we call the below market element all right so uh we then have to uh consider we consider the setup as actually the related part setup where uh the loan has been given at below market value so we consider it as a, a an investment we might co consider accounting for the whole transaction is simply is simply a capital contribution where we are saying the parent has actually increased its capital contribution um, in the subsidiary all right um, so it will be like uh, an investment in the subsidiary actually all right so the guiding if it's there would be uh, the if it's three okay business combination or or is 10 you know uh, consolidated financial statements all right that's what we'll be using then all right but uh, here we uh, i'm just in um, stimulating some inquisitive inquisitivity in you to see uh to go beyond your the requirements of your examination uh in the exam you just have to elaborate that you need to know the terms if to see if they were on commercial or non-commercial terms and uh, non-commercial terms might give indications that uh the transaction could be between a related party and a related, a related part disclosures should be actually made however uh the loan itself should uh continue i mean should continue to be accounted for in terms of if it's nine okay in terms of the uh, the classification the measurement or the payment that is involved all right uh, but if there was if it was a non-commercial uh, element uh, i mean if it was a non-commercial setup then we have to consider the below market element as well as the loan element all right and uh, the below market element is to be accounted as follows all right as follows where a loan uh, is made by a parent to a subsidiary and is not on normal commercial terms we believe uh, the difference between the, no the loan amount and its fair value should be recorded as follows all right an investment in the parents separate from those statements all right should be recorded as an investment in the parent's separate financial statements that is as a component of the overall investment in the subsidiary all right or <clears throat> a component of equity in the subsidiary's uh, individual financial statements this is sometimes referred to as a capital contribution all right so this is actually consistent with the conceptual framework which defines income as increases in economic benefits during uh, the accounting period in the form of inflows or enhancements of assets or, like, or, or decreases of liabilities that result in increase in equity other than those relating to contributions from equity participants all right uh, so th that's uh, uh, basically what we'll be talking about here. All right. So there is actually much more to uh, to to say when you are given a task to perform substantive procedures on loans. All right. So you need to review the loan agreement to see the terms of the loans. All right. The terms of the loan. All right. Also, the cash, the cash book, like I said, would also give you evidence to see that the, uh, the, uh, the loan was actually made at what particular date was it received. 
all right and the bank statements also support support whatever uh, the, F, the, the the cash book is saying and also the bank confirmation letter this uh that would uh elaborate on the state of uh our of the client's uh compliance with the terms of the loan their payment repayment capabilities and so forth now uh intangible assets let's talk of intangible assets i'm sorry i spent much time on this area because you know uh i felt it was there was need to do so to ensure you are comfortable with the area of substantive procedures with regards to loans now intangible assets we are going to use the same acronym EVCR because they are financial state uh, statement of financial position item so we need to uh, know the following sources of evidence where we are saying you must obtain the breakdown of expenditure during the year to see which costs were actually accumulated to the intangible asset all right uh the purchases invoices the time sheets time sheets for labor on a particular uh, asset which was being uh researched on or developed and then in this case remember when we are talking of intangible assets these are development costs as well as costs in acquiring the brands etc the licenses all right so time sheets on on the uh, i mean for the labor which was involved in developing a particular item of intangible assets the development expenditure or project plans should also be reviewed uh, project test or trial results to see if it is actually feasible uh, to become a, an asset okay if it is feasible to complete the project all right so the the results of, the, of of whatever tests that has been done should be communicated to see if there are some positive prospects to succeed in the project then cash flow forecast should also be considered because by the end of the day the intangible asset should be able to meet the definition of an asset so are we able to get some economic rewards some economic benefits from this asset from developing this asset the license agreements should also be reviewed third party valuation report for example brand names and trademarks we need professional valuations valuation reports to ascertain if the valuation by management is correct then the amortization policy and rents like depreciation policy and rents should also be be known or be inspected okay also please uh, know this about uh, intangible assets there is a difference between uh, research and uh, development they're different they are different research and development these two terms are different and in the world of intangible assets or in the world of ias 38 intangible assets these two words are very common and they are going to hound us all right we are talking of research research is original and planned investigation undertaken with the prospect of gaining new scientific or technical knowledge and understanding all right so an example of research could be a common in the pharmaceuticals industry undertaking activities or tests aimed at obtaining new knowledge to develop a new vaccine especially in this coronavirus thing all right if a company undertakes uh, research okay 
uh, research activities or tests aimed at obtaining new knowledge to develop a new vaccine, then we can say they are into research. Okay, they are incurring research expenses. The government is researching the unknown, and therefore, at this early stage, no future economic benefit can be expected to flow to the entity. All right, now. When we are talking of development, development is the application of research findings on other knowledge to a plan or design for the production of new or substantially improved materials, devices, products, processes, systems, or services before the start of commercial production or use. All right, so when we are talking of development, this is the application of those research findings. So you study by research and after researching something, you obtain some findings, all right? But now, using those, in those findings or applying those findings, that's the issue of development, okay? An example of development is a car manufacturer, for example, Telsa, okay, undertaking the design, construction, and testing of a pre-production model. Remember, there is uh, there is much hype up about tells us say uh, uh, robo taxi the robo taxi uh, which is uh, which does not, does not need a driver uh, behind the wheels for this particular taxi so uh, it is actually still in the stage of development all right but the research has already been done all right uh, that's development expenditure. All right. So, how do you treat, um, or how do you recognize uh, research, and how do you recognize development expenditure? All right. We need to be guided by IAS uh, 38. IAS 38. IAS 38 uh, states that an intangible asset is to be recognized if and only if the following criteria are met. All right, how do we recognize an intangible asset? So let us be led here by the ISA, the, the relevant IAS, relevant accounting standard. All right, so I'm looking for my eraser here. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm rubbing off these things so that uh, we don't have a clutter there. So, uh, recognition criteria. Recognition criteria. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to underline and I'm ending up crossing everything. Oh, sorry. Just assume it's an underline. Okay, recognition criteria. All right. Um, it should be probable uh, that future economic benefits probable. Uh, future economic benefits uh, will, flow, will flow to the entity from the asset okay from this particular asset future economic benefits from the asset will, will flow to the entity and the asset the cost of the asset can be measured reliably or reliably measured reliably measured <laughs> it should be reliably measured all right so those are the two uh, recognition criteria that should be uh, considered for us to recognize the intangible asset. However, uh, we need to also account for research and development. Uh, research, like I like like I have already indicated, is still an expenditure. No asset is yet. Uh, uh, is yet available 
okay there is still research on it so uh, the research phase uh, should should only be considered as an expense so should be expense to the profit or loss so as a result international account standard number 38 states that uh, all expenditure incurred at the research stage should be written off to the income statement as an expense as an expense when incurred and will never be capitalized as an intangible asset so we are saying that the research stage should be expense to the statement of profit or loss okay statement of profit or loss okay the spl all right but now we have got development expenditure all right development expenditure is now different all right in terms of i state eight let me just try to wrap off again because i need this space to illustrate something there are so many points that have to be illustrated uh, or explained okay uh, Under International Accounting Standard number 38, an intangible asset arising from development must be capitalized. It should be capitalized, uh, but only if an entity can demonstrate uh, all of the following criteria. So, development expenditure is tricky, all right. It shouldn't always be capitalized, but it should be capitalized only if capitalized capitalize only if number one okay uh, the technical technical uh, feasibility feasibility of completing the intangible assets The technical feasibility of completing the the intangible asset can be demonstrated. So, if you can't demonstrate that uh, you can uh, technically, uh, I mean, I mean, if you can't demonstrate that the uh, there is a technical feasibility of completing the asset, then uh you can't uh recognize an asset you can't recognize development costs otherwise you need to expense them to the profit or loss there should be uh a demonstration of the intention to complete so this is why the Tesla CEO uh, is much spoken about. He can demonstrate that he has the intention to complete and use and sell and use or sell the asset. Mr. Musk is a, is somebody uh, who is uh, actually. <laughs> Uh, interested in the feasibility, the technical feasibility and completion of the of the uh, the robot taxi. So there is no way you can recognize that as a development expenditure. That expenditure should be capitalized. All right. So the entity should demonstrate the intention to complete and use or sell the asset. It should also demonstrate the ability to use or sell the asset they should demonstrate the ability to use or sell 
the asset. There should be the, uh, the such an ability being demonstrated that we are going to use and sell this asset. All right. So you as an auditor, you know, how do you see, uh, how can uh, an entity demonstrate that? By providing you the forecast, they should demonstrate from their forecasts, from their market research findings, if the Robotex is going to be uh, procured. Obviously, in this generation uh, Z, uh, everyone is actually interested in everything that is to do with digital progression, uh, digital advancement. So everything, every new product that is coming along the lines of digital or digitization is going to be bought because the, the market is ready for such products. All right. The other thing that should be demonstrated is the existence of a market or if to be used internally, the usefulness of the asset. Sometimes the uh, product that is being produced is not going to be sold to the market outside but it's going to improve our internal processes so there should be some demonstration on how the asset is going to be useful to the business there is also need for demonstration of availability of adequate technical financial or other resources to complete the asset if you visit the Tulsa corporation you will see all forms of scientists available so that's a complete demonstration that Everything is available, everything is adequate from, from technical, uh, financial, and other resources to complete the asset. Then, uh, lastly, uh, demonstration of the cost of the asset. Um, I mean, demonstration that the asset's cost could be measured reliably. All right. So those are the uh, recognition criteria for development costs. All right. So uh, we need to be aware of those things before we go anywhere. That was uh, for development expenditure. All right. That was intended as a hindsight for our revision of development expenditure. All right, so whenever you do your procedures, just have to, uh, you need to know what does the accounting standard say about um, such items. How are they treated? How are they recognized in the financial statement before you launch, uh, you launch your procedures? All right, so cash flow forecasts, these ones, for example, cash flow forecasts, these ones are there to uh, help the auditor see if this particular asset which is being claimed, sorry, my eraser is malfunctioned, to see if the particular asset being claimed by management actually satisfies the recognition criteria uh, of a development expenditure. All right, so the cash flow focus to support that the entity is likely to, the, the, there is a high likelihood that uh, economic benefits will flow to the entity, okay? Or there is availability or existence of a market, okay? For that product, all right? From the cash flow focus, the cash flow focus will tell if there is market, because if there is a market, then there is there are going to be some inflows of cash all right or uh, sometimes we don't need the cash flow forecast uh, directly linked to the asset but the cash flow forecast would be in the form of enhanced sales in general of other assets because when we will be using this particular product internally then uh, our processes will be so efficient and we will be having some other positive results from other departments or from the sales of all other products. So the, this is uh, an issue to do with the scenario. You need, you need to understand what the scenario is talking about. Sometimes this product which is being capitalized is being developed to enhance internal processes, internal efficiencies. So 
we need to see forecasts from affected departments, like for example the production department, to see their forecast in terms of production forecasts. All right, forecasts need not only to be monitored; they might be production forecasts, which from a cost center, which does not uh, bring money directly, but we will be seeing things like positive improvement in terms of quantities produced, tonnages produced, etc. Okay, now uh, the substantive procedures on share capital and dividends. On share capital, our source documents are the uh, share certificates, you know, the share register. Okay, the company keeps a share register for its shareholders. The share certificates, which are issued to each shareholder, you might also uh, have an inspection of. Uh, a share certificate, a, co a copy of those certificates which have been issued to shareholders, and uh, bank statements and cash book for whatever share issue that is occurred during the year. All right, and then the board minutes for approval or authorization of whatever share issue that took place during the year. Okay, and for the reasonableness of the share issue, was there any need for you to issue any? Fed the shares and so forth, and then uh, register of company's reports. Uh, if the company is actually uh, complying with its with the requirements of the register of companies, all right. And in terms of their correspondence, when it comes to uh, the issue for. Uh, shareholding issues all right shareholding issues now uh on dividends you need to review board minutes usually this is linked to the approval of the dividend and uh, whether there was an approval for increase or decrease of a dividend and so forth then the bank statement for evidence of dividends paid, and then uh, inspection of the dividend warranty. All right. So uh, when you are talking of uh, dividend warranty, uh, this is simply a document. Document. All right. Uh, showing the, that the shareholder. He is entitled to a dividend. He is entitled to a dividend. Why should auditors worry about dividend warrants? All right. Uh, this actually gives evidence that the the dividend was not only declared; uh, it was payable. All right. It was payable. Because when a warrant is actually given, shows that the dividend was actually being paid. All right. So that's the reason there. Now you need to be uh, comfortable with these accounting standards: National Accounting Standard Number One, Presentation of Financial Statements, IS Two Inventories, IS Ten Consolidated Financial Statements. I skist in proper plan equipment, I skist in uh, I state six in payment of assets, uh, state seven uh, provisions, contingent assets and contingent liabilities. Oh, uh, I'm not sure if I um, that changed certain uh, uh, terms there. That's provisions, uh, contingent uh, assets and contingent liabilities. Okay, stuff like that. And then uh, IS38, uh, that's uh, intangible assets and if it's 15 revenue from contracts with customers. You just have to be comfortable with these accounting standards to ensure on exam day you are uh, as swift as a cheater. Now, uh, 
you can just download the summaries you know the summaries of these national county standards on the on the website you know on the web okay on the internet just just download the, the summaries the summaries and then uh because from those summaries of accounting treatments how an, an issue should be treated that's when you can safely address or come up with a relevant substantive procedure all right uh ladies and gentlemen we can at least do uh the first two uh past ACA exam questions together so that we call it a day but the last tip is that think about the procedures all right when you are developing substantive procedures think about the procedures uh that is the r-a-e-o-u where you said the analytical procedures inquiry or confirmation inspection observation and recalculation or reperformance think about the assertions uh the evcr or coca think about typical sources of evidence the data tree get clues hints tips ideas from the story itself think about the relevant accounting treatment and seek to verify it that's the last tip ladies and gentlemen nobody must fail i say nobody must fail this upcoming audit examination now let us read this uh aka past question the aa uh past question for september 2016. and when co manufactures chemical compounds using a continuous production process its year end was 31st july 2006 and the draft profit before tax was 36 or uh, 13.6 million okay that's the profit before tax all right you are the audit supervisor and the year end audit is due to commence shortly the following matters have been brought to your attention and we know that for materiality purposes we say that five percent of bp pbt is material anything that is above five percent of pbt is material now uh the following matters have been brought to your attention the evaluation of property plant and equipment at the beginning of the year at the beginning of the year uh, management undertook an extensive uh review of yolanda Yolanda cost non current asset valuations and as a result decided to update the current value of all PPE. All right, the finance director Peter Duman contacted his brother Martin, who is a valuer, and requested that Martin's firm undertake the valuation, which took place in August 20x5. Mm. That's five marks there. That's uh, the issue there, so you can go straight to the requirement essay and hear for yourself. Required describe substantive procedures you should perform to obtain sufficient, appropriate, or evidence in relation to the above three matters. So, substantive procedures in relation to this to suff to to perform. I mean, you should perform. Describe substantive procedures you should perform to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence in relation to the above three matters. So, uh, in relation to the uh, first item, they want five, they they will give you five marks there. All right. So you just have to describe the substantive procedures. All right. Uh, in relation to this part. All right. And um, we are being told that there was a revaluation. Which was, which took place, and the revaluer was the brother to the to the finance director, <laughs> Peter Duma. All right, so um, you just have to know how or what could be or what could be the procedures applicable there. All right, um, if you are inquisitive about the brotherliness between the finance director and the valuer uh, and you just have to pinpoint the risk 
attached to that but remember you are not uh, required to list the risk okay but by knowing the risk you then have to know what procedure you have to 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 perform to attend to that risk okay uh, to ensure that the valuation or the revaluation was actually done above board so what procedure do you do to verify that the valuation was done above board all right that's that's the answer that is going to give you a mark if you simply just list uh there was a uh, uh some uh, familiarity uh, whatever between the finance director and and uh, uh, his brother this and that you will get a zero because that has never been asked and maybe it's nothing to do uh, with the valuation right so um, let us try to come up with the substantive procedure related to the revaluation of property plant and equipment all right uh we need to obtain uh a schedule of the ppe so uh, let me just try to look for a, a more darker pen there um, something that is a bit darker all right uh the first one we can obtain a schedule okay of all PPE all right during the year for what why do we need a schedule of all PPE during the year all right and cast because remember a schedule is just a list of the PPE okay with their values so you then have to cast to confirm completeness and accuracy of the revaluation adjustment and we have to agree to um, trial balance and uh, the financial statements that's one mark <laughs> so obtain a schedule of all the property plant and equipment during the year and cast to confirm completeness and accuracy of the revaluation adjustment and agree to trial balance and financial statements okay we can also be assisted with what we uh, wrote here about non-current assets the current asset register all right you can also use this uh, as part of uh, our substantive procedures to the revaluation all right but you can see here that the difference here is that here we are uh, are looking at the non-current asset figure as it is but in this case we are being asked to worry about the revaluation so this is why I say that the same non-current assets might be uh, asked in a scenario specific situation okay so if you simply take the substantive procedures for non current asset as a general value you are going to lose the marks because you spend much of your time and says inspect the non current asset register for what you then have to link to uh, for evidence that uh, the revalued amounts have been adjusted accordingly in the register all right they they should be uh, adjusted accordingly in the register so if you simply ignore then by the end of the day you you are going to to be lost along the way you have to tailor your solutions to 
the question to the scenario. Okay. Uh, let us try to attack using our EVCR. All right. Um, let's talk something about the valuation. Let's talk about the valuation. All right. Let's talk about the valuation. Um, we know you are worried that um, Duman, uh, Peter Duman and his brother could be uh, so related or could be too related that they, the object, they, there is no objectivity in the way they do the evaluation exercises. So uh, what procedures are you going to do? All right. Uh, consider. Remember, remember procedures are actions. Procedures are action. This is why we put verbs. For example, in the first uh, procedure that there was obtain. Obtain is a verb, is an action. Here, consider, consider, okay? Consider whether the valuation, my spelling, my spelling for whether, okay? okay? Whether the valuation uh, undertook by Peter Dolman's brother <coughs> was um, sufficient and objective or sufficiently objective objective okay Consider whether the valuation undertook by Peter Dumas' brother was sufficiently objective. All right. How do you do this? Discuss with management. Okay. Discuss with management uh, whether Martin. Uh, Duma had an financial interest in the company, the Luanda Co. In Luanda Co. Sometimes you just have to, you know, throw in the the name of the company to bring uh, the, the examiners. Uh, I mean, to, to make the examiners feel that the candidate was actually attentive to the scenario. Just have to convince them. Don't ignore the names of those companies or the names of the directors or whatever party that that has been spoken about within a scenario. By so doing, you will be convincing the examiners that you were very attentive and you had the time, you were managing your time properly. You're not just rushing up things like... Uh, if, uh, for example, generalizing that, like, uh, I, I consider whether uh, Martin Duman had some financial interest in the company. Which company are we talking about? Specify the company. Speak about it. Okay. So, uh, discuss with management whether Martin Duman had any financial interest in Ilanda Core. Which, uh, along with the family relationship, could have some impact. Which, along uh, with the family relationship, could have had an impact on his objectivity or independence okay you can see that it is not easy to get a mark okay but you can only get a mark if you sufficiently explain your procedure 
there shouldn't be any vagueness when when a marker reads your procedure. You must exhaust everything you know about that procedure. So you have to tell us the action you are going to do and why you want us to consider your action as valid. Why is it a good action? What do you want to achieve by doing that action? So in this case, consider whether the evaluation undertaken was uh, sufficiently objective. Because you are, you are worried. There couldn't be some there couldn't be some objectivity because these guys are brothers. So you are worried. So consider whether the evaluation undertook by Peter Dumas' brother was uh, was uh, sufficiently objective. Then discuss with management whether Martin Duman had any financial interest because objectivity could only be impaired if there is some issue of gain involved. If there are some financial interests in the Luanda Court, the fact that these guys are just brothers can't actually be a, a, an issue to worry in the professional circles. But it becomes an issue if it is now <coughs> being supported by some financial interests in Luanda Court, which alone with the family relationship could have had an, an impact on his independence. Okay, you're done there. You need. You also need to reread the scenario for the second time to originate more. But in the exam, remember, you won't have more time, and you're not always expected to have as much winding and long procedures as these ones. But here, for the purpose of learning, we expect you to come up with solid and well explained substantive procedures as these ones okay let's talk something about the uh, revaluation remember we are being led by the existence how do we uh, test the existence of the ppe this one should be symbol that's a symbol non card asset uh, uh, evaluation okay so you need to uh, talk of the existence but bearing in mind the issues to do with uh, valuation okay for all revalued assets uh, confirm existence by physically inspecting Okay, going back to the issue of uh, valuation, to the issue of valuation, agree the revalued uh, amounts, the revalued amounts uh, through the valuation report. For what? To the valuation report uh, by the valuer. Of course, for for argument, okay, or for uh, yes, that's for agreement. So, so there is actually no need to say for agreement because we have already said agree. So agree the revalued amounts to the valuation report by the value all right uh, you may also add and say uh, for uh, valuation all 
all right and then um still on this particular valuation issue we may also talk of uh, uh inspect or review review the valuation report for evidence that all assets in the same category or class the same class or class have been revalued all right all right um obtain a schedule of yeah, cast confirm completeness and accuracy all right uh evaluation and uh, completeness let's talk of completeness uh, uh agree agree uh the revalued amounts agree the revalued amounts uh for for the these assets for these assets um uh, are correctly included in the our current asset register so we are centered on revaluation revaluation the revalued amounts it is it all right so you have to agree that the amounts or the adjustments made during the year with regards to revaluation is actually been reflected in the asset register all right only five were required and you can see that we are already uh it's number six okay just to be safe you can just write seven of them per each all right um then uh just for you know for accuracy and you can also uh talk of uh, the recalculation issues all right recalculation so recalculate recalculate uh the total revaluation revaluation adjustment and agree uh correctly to the <coughs> revaluation surplus where do you get the revaluation surplus where do you record it the revaluation surplus in the other comprehensive income or the revaluation reserve if you expand from uh from here even if you were supposed to get a 49 percent <laughs> the examiners would say i ah, know let him cross over because he really knows what he's writing about okay because 
most of the people who pass this paper are not actually uh, auditors at heart, but <laughs> they are people who show some maturity. You know, you know, you need not to be uh, more sophisticated, but you just have to show that you are ready and jovial. You are very jovial and jocund. You are ready to just cross over. Okay, we're done there. We're done. Um, you can also add that uh, you uh, review the financial statements, review uh, the FS, review the financial statements, uh, disclosures relating to the uh, revaluation. To ensure they comply with IAS system. For example, here I just have to write an example. For example, uh, the uh, whether a professional valuer was used and his particulars <laughs> more details about this professional who has been employed to value uh, to revalue our properties okay Okay, uh, I've opened up here in additional account standard number 16. Uh, this is paragraph uh, 77. All right, we wanted to verify. Uh, this is to do with the disclosures. So, if items of property, plant, and equipment are stated at fee valued amounts, the following shall be disclosed in addition to the disclosures required by IFRI 18. All right, so. Uh, the effective date of the revaluation that's another example of a disclosure that should be made by the uh, managers you as an auditor should you should also see that such disclosure is there about the effective date of the revaluation and then uh, whether an independent valuer was involved we've spoken about but there are some items which have been deleted concerning the uh, the details of the valuer and so forth so you need not to mention that they've been deleted this is an, a revised um, standard it's a reversed uh, standard the reverse version of IAS uh, 16 be careful there so uh, we need to actually adjust accordingly to uh, the issue that uh, you should have to, you need to mention that whether a professional value uh, was uh, used all right uh, that's the uh, disclosure required but not use um, particulars or details uh, would, uh, that one would be an, a voluntary disclosure but I mentioned that uh, a value had been used And um, it's not uh, only a value, a professional value, but it should be an independent value. The proper word is independent. An independent value. Now, obviously, it's a professional value, but it should be an independent value. All right, so details, uh, the, the entity is to disclose whether an independent value has been used. So you as an auditor, your job is just to see if such uh, disclosures have been made, including the effective date of the revaluation. Okay, let's get back to our question and finish a little Now, event valuation. Your firm attended the year-end event count for a little call and ascertained that the procedures for recording work in progress and finished goods was acceptable both working uh, working in progress and finished goods are material 
to the financial statements and the quantity and stage of completion of all going or ongoing um, reduction uh, I mean production was recorded accurately during the month or ongoing production this is a P there then during the event count the the count supervisor noted that a consignment of finished goods compound e two three e two four three with a value of seven hundred twenty thousand was defective and that the chemical mix was incorrect the finance director believed that compound e two four three can be can still be sold at a discounted sum of four hundred thousand all right so from 720 to 400,000, it's actually a, ma a, a material difference there. So such a write down is, should be a worry to an auditor. Now, how do we account, how, I mean, what substantive procedures do we perform to this whole story about inventories? So let us do it quickly. Um, for us to have more space, since my space is now limited. All right, so let's talk about uh, substantive procedures. Substantive procedures uh, for inventory valuation. So already we have been told here that uh, when we are talking of inventory valuation. We are not targeting other associations like uh, existence, rights, and obligations. Here, the examiner is specific. You you want you to perform procedures related to valuation only, not any other uh, procedures for the EVCR. Okay, this is why the revaluation uh, issue we have just uh, discussed on was not applicable to uh, other associates like existence and uh, they wanted to, to just concentrate on the valuation aspect okay revaluation is linked to valuation all right here we are to consider or to incline ourselves on the infant valuation so uh the first thing we have to do we have to obtain obtain a schedule Okay, the schedule of all the schedule of all raw materials. Remember, this is a manufacturing company. All right, raw materials, finished goods. Why do we have to worry about this? Because they all constitute inventory and work in progress. Okay. And work in progress inventory and cast to confirm <laughs> to confirm completeness and accuracy of the balance and agree to the trial balance and FS okay so in this case uh, benchmarking with the trial balance would also assist you to see if the account uh, I mean the accounts of the company are, are in general balancing okay the trial balance shows a list of balances of every account in the general ledger okay so if it is balancing and there is no suspense account open then you can safely conclude that the accounts have been well uh, reported or are balancing all right although there are some errors which cannot be detected by the trial balance but at this juncture, just presume uh, after you have done everything uh, during your audit, by seeing a balance in trial balance, you can be rest assured that the, the odd risk is minimized. All right. So, in your uh, evaluation of the valuation of the inventory, here we are saying that 
Yes, to obtain a schedule of raw materials, finished goods, and, and work in progress, inventory, and cards to confirm completeness and accuracy of the balance and agree to the trial balance and financial statements. All right, so you have to direct your EVCR with the valuation aspect. Okay, it has to be directed to the valuation aspect. Well, this is the aspect that is being required. If you simply say, uh, inspect the inventory for existence, that has nothing to do with the valuation of inventory. You need to then uh, modify your procedure to talk of the valuation. So in this case, obtain a schedule of raw materials, finished goods, and uh, working progress inventory, and cast to confirm completeness and accuracy of the balance the balance is of the value of inventory. The, this balance is the value of inventory. We are talking of the balance, uh, which is the value of the inventory. So you have to agree that balance uh, to the trial balance, as well as the financial statements under the current assets, the inventory value under the current asset, to see it's actually tallied. Then, um, another procedure there, now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to speak only three procedures here for the for the benefit of our time, okay, for the purpose of our time. Um, other procedure is uh, obtain a breakdown, a breakdown of uh, working progress, and agree and agree a sample of work in progress assessed during the count during the event count uh, to the working progress schedule the working progress schedule okay agreeing the percentage completion is recorded at the inventory count. <laughs> so you have to obtain uh, the breakdown of all work in progress and agree a sample of working progress assessed during the count to the work in progress schedule. All right, agreeing the percentage completion as recorded at the inventory count. Then, uh, what about for those finished goods? For a sample of finished goods, the sample of finished goods. I'm um, sorry, my my pen is misbehaving. For a sample of finished goods. Uh, and also, and and W I P. Um, we need to uh obtain the relevant cost sheets. All right, relevant cost sheets, and confirm. raw material raw material costs uh, raw material costs to recent uh, purchase invoices remember we want to 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 evaluate the valuation of inventory uh, okay, to recent purchase invoices, labor costs, labor costs uh, to timesheets, labor costs to timesheets or wage records 
and overhead allocated uh, and overhead allocated are of a production nature so you just have to review okay like i said you're not going to originate such a long uh, procedure but uh i'm just i just want to emphasize the issue of uh critically explaining okay sufficiently explaining your procedure so that the markers will understand what you want to achieve and why you are saying this procedure is okay all right so for a sample of finished uh goods okay for example of finished inventory or working progress uh you need to obtain a relevant uh the relevant cost sheet and confirm raw material costs to recent purchase invoices labor costs to time sheets or wage records and overheads allocated are of a production nature sometimes the overheads will relate to other issues like marketing or distribution costs which could not be part of the uh, cost of the commodity all right um, there are other uh, procedures uh, which you could also consider uh, like for example for example of inventory items uh, review the calculation for equivalent units and associated equivalent unit cost and recalculate the inventory valuation remember when we are talking of a manufacturing environment you have to borrow your knowledge from your costing standard costing uh, knowledge okay or, or, or modules okay the management accounting module or performance management module you just have to borrow all such knowledge because this is a manufacturing environment where uh, costing comes into play all right uh, you need to talk of the uh, NRV issues, the edged, edged listings, ETC, obtain an edged analysis or edged listing, edged inventory listing uh, for evidence of slow moving stock uh, and to assess if uh, there is need for a write down of inventory. Right? So select a sample of year end finished goods and review post year end sales invoices. To ascertain if the net realizable value is above cost uh, or if an adjustment is required okay uh, there was also an issue which was spoken about in the scenario a specific issue which you have to relate to uh, during the inventory count the consignment supervisor noted a consignment of finished goods compound e 243 with a value of 720 was defective in that the chemical mix was incorrect the finance director believes that uh, the compound e243 can uh, still be sold at a discounted sum of 400 and 400,000 so uh, you have to talk about that uh, for the defective chemical compound to e243 uh, discuss with management uh, their plans uh, I'm sorry, there's a call. So, uh, there is need uh, for you as the auditor to um, um, to discuss with the management with respect to the product E243, okay, on their plans or, I mean, for disposing of the goods um, and why they feel or they believe that uh, the NRV of this of this product is four hundred thousand. They you need to get some reasonable uh, facts, and in the form of a written representation that managers believe the inventory could could be sold for four hundred thousand. All right. If n uh, of the E two four three has been sold post year end. You have to agree at what value were they being sold by uh, agreeing to the sales invoices to assess if the NRV had actually fallen. All right. 
Then you have also have to agree uh, the cost of uh, 720,000 uh, for the compound. This 720,000. Uh, where is my pen now? What's going on? All right. Um, 720. Okay. You have to agree the cost of 720 for the compound E243. Uh, to supporting documentation to confirm the raw material costs, labor cost, and any overhead attributable to the cost. Because remember, this for 720,000 for the uh, finished good would, would also involve the raw material cost, the direct labor cost, and other direct, uh, lab, I mean, direct costs which could have been attributable to it, for example, overhead. <coughs> okay. And then um, you can just please do not forget this is actually the very simplest one where uh, you need to uh, review the financial statements disclosures relating to inventory and work in progress to ensure they comply with international accounting standard number two and you just have to cite uh, an example of such disclosure okay an example of such disclosure as per IAS2, for example, an example would be uh, the accounting policy uh, for valuation of inventory, whether they are using the fee for or the average cost in valuing the inventories. That's an example of the disclosure that could be required. Also, in respect of the difference between 720 and uh, the 720 and this 400 there is a uh, 320,000 uh, write down uh, so you uh, as part of your procedure you need to confirm if the final the final adjustment for this product e, uh, compound e243 uh, e, it has been uh, written down okay uh, so you need to determine if the 320 in respect of if the 320 thousand dollars in respect of uh, product uh, compound E243 uh, has been written down, and you also have to discuss with management if this adjustment uh, has been made, and if so, uh, you need to uh, follow through the write down to confirm. You need to see the evidence that. Uh, the value has been written down and the inventory is now being reported as uh, 400,000. Okay, that is it. Let's talk of the bank loan. Uh, Yolanda Co secured a bank loan of 2.6 million on 1 October 24, repayments of 200,000 are due quarterly with a lump sum of. 800,000 due for repayment in January 2007. The company made all loan payments in 2005 on time but was late in paying the April and July 2006 repayment. All right. Uh, and our year end from the question, we are told that the year end is 31st July 20. X6. All right, and uh, the final uh, payment, uh, the lump sum is due on 1 January 20X7, which is almost about six months to come. All right, six months to come. So, what are the substantive procedures to be uh, garnered by the uh, auditor? All right, he has to uh, agree the opening balance of the bank loan to the prior year and audit file and financial statement so uh, on the opening balance of the loan you need to actually see if the opening balance tallies with what with the closing balance which was captured in the previous year audit file okay in the previous year audit file and uh, the financial statements all right what the financial statements reported last year is it actually entirely with the opening balance for the loan 
all right then for any loan payments made during the year we need to agree to the cash uh, to the cash book for evidence of a cash outflow all right and bank statements so the bank statements in the cash flow should actually be reviewed for that evidence so you need to agree uh the cash outflow to the cash book and the bank statement for evidence of cash uh, of loan repayments during the year loan payments now you also need to review the bank correspondence to identify whether any late payment penalties have been uh, levied and agreed and agreed these have been charged to profit or loss account as finance finance charges all right they should be accounted for as finance charges you also have to obtain a uh, direct confirmation at the year end from uh, the loan provider of the outstanding balance and any security provided and agree confirmed amounts to the loan schedule and financial statements so there is need to conduct the financer and obtain a comprehensive letter from them um, for any outstanding balances and any security provided this is why we say that you have to also consider inspecting the loan agreement itself for the terms and conditions attached to the loan okay I review the loan agreement for details of covenants and recalculate the recalculate to identify any breaches in this then agree the closing balance of the loan to the trial balance and draft financial statements and that the disclosure is adequate including any security provided that the loan is disclosed as a current liability and disclosure is in accordance with accounting standards and local legislation and you can not you, you can also uh, get a bit pedantic and uh, tell the examiner that you are referring to IFRS 9 financial instruments okay uh, let's talk of part B describe the procedures with the auditor of Yolanda Corps should perform in assessing whether or not the company is a going concern this a going concern procedures we know them and we talked about them in our uh, lecture series and also in part of the uh, video which we sent about uh, uh, audit reporting and uh, uh, subsequent events where we talked of the going content issues or right, okay for the purpose of this question uh, the going content issues which we might uh, I mean the procedures for the going content which you might make as an auditor you can op uh, obtain uh, you learn the cash flow forecast and review the cash in and out flows the cash in and out flows okay assess the assumptions for reasonableness and discuss the findings with management uh, to understand if the carbon will have sufficient cash flows to meet liabilities as they for due so they, they just need to obtain their uh, cash flow forecast from management and review cash in and out and out flows then you have to assess the assumptions on those focus for their reasonableness and discuss the findings with management to understand if the company will have sufficient cash flows to meet liabilities as they fall due okay excuse me there's a call hello okay uh it seems uh, uh we've taken much of our time uh on this question and in this presentation but i just want to uh speak about the the two further uh audit substantive procedures which you might uh, i mean procedures which the auditor would perform with regards to the going concern of Yolanda call all right um you can also consider in uh, discussion with management in respect of their ability to settle the next installment due for the repayment to the bank and the lump sum payment of 800,000 because we are told in the scenario 
that there is a lump sum that is due within six months of 800,000 that is in January 2087. So you need to discuss their ability to settle that and ensure um, this has been included in the cash flow forecast as well because you know the fact and when you say that uh, management should prepare a cash flow forecast and give it to you, you also have to see if those figures, uh, those lump sum payments are considered in the forecast, they should appear there. All right, you also need to review the carbon spot year and sales and order book to assess the levels of trade and if the revenue figures in the cash flow forecast are reasonable. Some, um, because they have already prepared the cash flow forecast and they, they have indicated that the sales will also be part of the sources of inflows, then you need to, to see if um, the cash flow is uh, uh, showing some significant or material sales transactions that are going to take place to support the cash flow forecast okay um, and this should be post year end actually post year end sales then you have to review post year end correspondence to suppliers to identify whether any restrictions in credit have arisen and if so ensure that the cash flow forecast reflects the current credit terms or where necessary an immediate payment for trade payables. So you can see that the going concern issues are um, centered on the cash flow forecast, whether the inflows or outflows. Inquire of the lawyers of Yolanda Co. as to the existence of any litigation and claims, if any, uh, then consider the, their materiality and impact on the coin going concern uh, assumption of the company. Then perform audit tests in relation to subsequent events to identify any items which might indicate or mitigate the risk of going concern not being appropriate. All right, here we are saying that uh, you need to determine if, in actual fact, the entity is to report based on a going concern basis or on a breakup basis. You need to determine that. Review the post year and board minutes to identify any other issues which might indicate financial difficulties for the company. Review post and management account to assess if in line with cash flow forecast and if in line with cash flow forecast and to identify any issues which may be relevant to the going concern assessment. Consider whether any additional disclosures is required by IS-1 presentation of financial statement in relation to material and of overgoing consent should be made in the financial statement. Obtain a written representation confirming, uh, confirming the director's view that Yolanda Co. is a going consent. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope um, this presentation has been um, useful to you okay in your uh, preparation for the final ARCA audit and assurance paper that is scheduled this coming week until then may the good lord continue to bless and bless and bless you okay uh let me just try to put our conduct again um for your reference okay and uh please don't forget to reply this video anytime you feel before you enter into that example for the purpose of revitalizing your memory and uh enhancing or polishing up your the state of your affairs in your uh in your brain okay in your head in your heart so that on exam day you remember this voice you remember these pictures you remember this presentation as part of your uh armor to the wall okay as part of your armor to the wall all right so those are our conducts if you feel you need more assistance or further assistance in any other subject which you are going to study please consider studying with us for september uh for september 2022 20, exams the classes are already rolling and we expect uh you guys to get in touch with us as soon as possible after examinations after examinations just consider starting uh studying 
another module whilst you still have got more time. All right, so that when we reach our August second week, we start our revision, critical revision, so that you sit for your September exams and pass them. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, I am signing out.